Beautiful. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Welcome to Artwork Insight. I'm so excited to, uh, for you to meet our first guest today. I met him, well not first guest, our guest today. I met him at an art fair in Atlanta and I can't wait for you to hear his moving story and for him to share his moving art with you as well. His name is Eme, or he goes by Eme. So thanks so much for joining us. Thank you. I'm so happy to have you today, like I said, and let's just dive right in. Okay. Uh, so is it correct that your very sp first experience with art was when you started drawing and painting at the age of five? Yeah, that, that's, that, that's true a little bit, but um, I think I started very early to really get very acquainted with colors or see colors and I want to touch it just like every other kid could would love okay. to express themselves and play with colors so I've always been very drawn to colors and drawing as I couldn't um, literally communicate in any way um, I had a little bit of problems when I was younger so art was the only thing I could really get comfortable with and express myself as early as five or even before then Okay, and did you want to talk a little bit about that, about the um, being able to express yourself or not, or having difficulty with expressing yourself? Yeah, so when I was around the age of five, six, seven, till like 10, it, it was it was a little bit, I don't know what word to use, but I, I could say I'm, I was dyslexic. I couldn't okay. literally read, I couldn't write, I couldn't even speak English. So I'm Nigerian. I um, I went to the University of Nigeria primary school. And I also went to the University of Nigeria in Suka, where I had both my primary, secondary school and including university. So oh, I'm wow, all in yeah, one school. All That's in, interesting. All in, yeah, I'm 100% I'm <laughs> original in Suka made. Right, right. Um, <laughs> but the funny thing is growing up in, a, in, a, in an environment where is a university environment so one would assume everyone there was very expressive smart that could read and write speak english and i was this young very banal timid young child that couldn't really play with other kids just because i i couldn't speak english and i was a little mm. bit i was a little bit bullied because of that i, I felt mm. i felt very less about myself i really didn't have any form of confidence self-awareness or even know what i can do and what i cannot do and that's really demeaning as a person, not being able to play along with other kids just because you can't express yourself. And because of the environment I grew up, they were just a little bit like, say, two, three steps ahead of me. So pretty much I just kept on drawing because in classes, um, so in Nigeria, we do grading, first position, second position, third position. That's how we are being dished out the report cards to know how efficient the student is performing in school. So I'm just always, trying to understand that a little better. Yeah. When you say you do grading, meaning you get grades? At the end of year, at the end of um, every time, you are being graded and you're being offered a report card, like this is your result, take it I home see. to your parents and let them know how you've performed. And they're, they're graded based on your position. If you come first, it means you're the smartest person in the class. Oh, if wow. you come second, it means uh, literally that's how it, it goes. All and the way down to like maybe it's the last or person so. to the year. Oh. To the year. And we are normally around 20 or 30, 30 something people in class. And guess what? I always do each time at the end of every time I get, I come last. Last? last. Wow. Yeah, so last how did that 30. feel? You know, it's, it, it, it really, um, I'm trying to find the right words so that I don't mix things up it just made me to accept the feet like to accept this is who i am i can I be more than i can be more than the last person and mm. this was me being very young and i'm my brother who was um literally two years ahead of me was he was incredibly smart he was very intelligent he could he could process things really fast and i'm like we are the same we are considerably the same age bracket right. and we are related <laughs> by blood i should be able to at least express myself the way he does but the margin is a lot so me coming last and looking at other people doing very well i felt like man this is where i have to be i'm just the last person and and everything i do is always like mm, that's not cool or you know he's he's not he's not going to make it or he's not going to do well so but anytime i draw people are like wow <laughs> you're doing this at the age of seven eight nine mm. so i'm like if people if i could find a sense of purpose in drawing look at their reaction so i'm a human being that some someone could look at it and feel like i can i cannot actually do something beautiful 
And that became some kind of an identity for me at a very young age. Mm. Have in mind that I couldn't read, I couldn't write. So drawing was very, I was very efficient in drawing. So I started expanding my horizon towards the shores of expression, expressing myself in art. I continued drawing because this is the only thing that see me do well. I'm going to do it to the best of my ability. And I just kept on drawing, drawing and kept on coming last position <laughs> <laughs> while I was being very efficient in drawing till around the age of 12 and 13, I was able to, you know, communicate a little bit in English language because I'm from Igbo land. I, I speak Igbo, like I'm, I'm an Igbo person. My name is Chinamere, literally I'm an Igbo person, which means God is doing for me. And I became um, efficient in communication around the age of 15, 16, to be honest. That was when I, I started communicating well in English. So I kind of fought my own self battle to have an identity. And what really gave me this identity was drawing and painting and my parents literally they, they they had to beat me when i was little to stop drawing because i wasn't concentrating in school they have to caution me try to beat me to make me stop but they could just see the drive is too much and there was nothing else i could do so they encouraged me they got me some mentors they pushed me my That's sister is a, is a huge backbone she supported me hmm. so i made i built cars i mean i was very very artsy i made cars that could run with batteries and some motors i picked from um from radio or something i just make cars move and built a fake laptop and so you know little artsy so they realized that this is something that I was good and then encouragement started coming after the after the kickback so i had a little bit of success with my family and the support they gave me but that goes to show that there's there are different levels of intelligence so intelligence a lot of times schools reward one type of intelligence but we have so many different types i mean the, the fact that you could build a car you know yeah. and put something that's like almost mm -hmm. like mechanical or engineering type intelligence and then your artwork speaks for itself. I mean, just looking at your artwork, we can see just, you know, the depth of where you go with your art. Like you said that you got uh, attention for doing your artwork, so that made you feel Pretty good. Nice. But it sounds like there was something more like a dr something driving you inside that you had to, you had to do the art. Like it, it helped you in some way or it was just innate. Would you say would, that? Yeah, I would say it's, I think I'm, I'm pretty much born for this. Um, I'm not even making it as an ex exaggeration. I think from everything happening, it's like an epiphany. It's like it's meant to happen. Sometimes mm -hmm. I say, even in my paintings, I make paintings that my story is written. I just have to walk into it, regardless of the failures and success. They are meant to be that way. I'm a strong component of, and the believer of my life is being written. I just need to walk into it. And part of the reason why I had an um, immense drive to really do what I do and in the way that I do it is, I remember saying to a teacher, mommy, I called a teacher mommy, because I'm, I'm, a, I'm a very home guy. I come from a very nurturing, beautiful family, daddy, mommy, father for security, for discipline, mom for love and, you know, and mm -hmm. healthy competitions for my siblings. And I'm the last out of seven people. Wow. So okay. <laughs> a lot of just, competition. <laughs> I, I, exactly. And I'm, I, I was the last even. So, um, so I, I grew up in this very loving, um, environment. And so why I call, when I call my female teachers, mommy, like she told me, I, I can never be your mom. I'm not your mommy. I can never be your mom. That, and I was very young when this happened and you hear comments that, like that when teachers are literally, um, telling you or making you feel less about yourself you know there is some sense of drive and a sense of reward that comes with conquering your adversities yeah. so mm -hmm. when i when i do what i do and people it's kind of a reward system a, a psychological reward system that makes me feel like i'm relevant the most yeah. essential human currency is attention and when you get attention it fuels whatever thing you have as a person so i navigated the turbulence world and found myself to my own individual identity and that was a drive and it shows, I would say, in your art. <laughs> I'm a fan, if you can tell. <laughs> oh, thank you. Thank you so if much. If you see me thank looking you. down, I'm just uh, trying to stay on point with, you know, making sure that we cover everything. Sure. So that's, that's what's going on there. Okay, that's a question I wanted to ask. What was one of the best things you learned in art school? In art school? Yes. Ooh. One thing that you learned. One thing that I've learned? Yeah, that you felt like really 
maybe was something you didn't know or really helped you in your uh, career or whatever? One thing I learned, it's I think it's there is there is no um, I can't I can't really put a name to it. Like at this point, this was the revolution or this was the breaking point. I don't have such stories. It's kind of a soft pedaling. It's a continuous endless of possibilities that I keep absorbing and grateful for the fact that I, I'm able to grow in the speed I'm growing and I'm able to absorb constantly. But there are some highlights I would like to mention. Um, my mom taking me to the fine art department when I was in primary four, primary five, I was already going to the University of Fine Arts to study with the, the students then. Wow. And As, believe, at what age? I was, I was around uh, 10, sorry, nine, 10 uh, in my primary five. Yes. That's impressive. <laughs> yeah. <thank Wow. laughs> you. Believe it or not, believe it or not, I was doing assignments for some people in school then. If I had access to my, my works when I was age 12 you wouldn't believe i was 12 when i made it till this wow. day i'm in, I, I'm in prayer. i'm not trying to blow my trumpet more <laughs> I look you, at my you, that's what you're here for <laughs> that's what we want to hear <laughs> so yeah. go go ahead and do that <laughs> so being able to um take me to the place that took me to at the time it's a privilege that i'm not sure many people have access to so my mom was essentially a huge support in my art system and that's that really exposed me very young and when i got into secondary school, I was already, people were saying, okay, this guy is popping. And mm. I had to go back to the university <laughs> still, when I was still in secondary school, I was still going there to get knowledge. So th those transitions and those things I really observed at the very early age is like a child taking the natural breast milk from the mom in a very early stage. So I really got those ingredients. But what I noticed that like, as I became older, I kind of noticed that painting and drawing is not just about what you do on canvas, but it's about your philosophy and your psychology towards mm -hmm. what you're doing, because these things are portals into our individual world. So I think the, the highlight for me is being able to um, sit around these very great artists that, that are very talented, that really show you that you've not started. Like, I don't even know anything when you see these people that are ahead of you, you admire, and okay. you hear them talk, you mm -hmm. hear them the way they communicate through their paintings, the way they feel about their paintings, that really, and some of my professors in school, they really, really um, helped me to unlock the ability to feel painting. And I think that's what matters more. It, it, it's even more important that, than the actual painting, but the thoughts process behind the painting right. gives life to whatever thing we are doing. So our body, our human suits is nothing without the soul. And that's how right. I feel about painting. That makes sense. It took it many levels deeper than just what's on the canvas. I mean, or, yes. or what's yes. in the paintbrush and what mm -hmm. when you're starting to paint, what comes out of it. Yeah. I like that. <laughs> I didn't think that would be the answer, but I like that. <laughs> <laughs> what did you think? So I'm thinking, oh, I learned, you know, how to um, blend certain colors or <laughs> I don't know, like something more um, technical in nature. Mm -hmm. But I like what you said because yeah. it went beyond the technical. Of course, of course. To, like you said, in the soul and deeper. So I Absolutely. like that. So we're going to uh, discuss a little bit about your process here. Um, do you have any rituals or practices that you go through when you're about to uh create a piece of art yeah in some sense yeah i would say that so that like i said before there's been a lot of growth there's been a lot of learning of oneself so previously when i did my when i graduated from the university i was i just painted and i as i kept on painting i something started germinating like a seed started growing in me i became a little bit more spiritual with my paintings mm -hmm. than it was before so i did a series called the crack story before after I painted the cracks, so which was essentially my homeland had cracks in um, in the environment. So I employed those cracks in my paintings just as a way of expression, as a metaphor for resilience. Um, but um, immediately I was done with my crack story. I became I came I I became working on what I call the saturated nostalgia, and that's when I started really developing this connection with spirituality. I read some books and. When I literally paint, I don't go out from my house. When I started painting, most paintings, I try not to leave the house to visit people, or I just try to stay within the confine of um, the space where I'm already germinating that seed called painting. And as I'm doing that, it kind of forms, it, it informs me of what to do and how to do it and 
the way to navigate the process till I get an answer, like till I achieve some certain level of um, connection with the painting in a way that I feel like, okay, it's okay to go out now. But if I start a painting, I don't feel like I don't have, um, I've not connected with it. I can't, I don't like to leave my, my space, even if it takes two, three days, four days, one week. Sometimes I get a call from friends, hey, we need to do this. I'm okay, I can't leave the house now until I get, um, and this is this has actually a very recent happening. It's not something that I, I, I was used to before. I started feeling that way not too long, say for the past eight months, it's been happening. And if you check mm. my paintings from eight months till now, it's very more spiritual than anything I've done before. You keep seeing ghosts, people in hello, people in right. transparency, you could see through them. And it's just uh, the process I go through right now in, in trying to prepare my mind is some kind of a beatification of the painting, a consecration of the painting, giving life to the painting. So do you, is there something specific that you do, like a meditation, or is it just like you're in the house, you're thinking about it, you're walking around and it comes to you? If it's too personal, you don't have to go into no. it, but if you, yeah. um, if there's something specific, I'm just trying to get a visual of what it looks like. Uh, Emma in the house, <laughs> you know, yeah. really trying to connect with this piece he's about to do. What is that process? So literally, this is how it works. I keep a bed in front of a canvas, lie down, wake up. Anytime I wake up, there is this kind of rejuvenation. I feel fresh and young, and I just wow. go to the canvas. I connect to it. I paint, and I don't paint for a long time. I mm. paint like five minutes, ten minutes, and I stop mm. painting. Okay. I leave the painting. I go and come back again. And it's and sometimes I I take like when I connect, when I I have my anchor on the ship. Boom! I spend like four hours, three hours painting straight. But before then, I just do five, five minutes and maybe five minutes in a day, I'm done for the day, but I'm painting in my mind. I'm always painting in my mind. Okay, that makes sense. Yeah. It sounds like you do one piece at a time, start to finish. Do you, or do you have some that you put to the side ever and come back to? So are you working on more than one at a time? Yes, I do. I do work on more than one at a time. Sometimes when I finish a piece, it's not finished. And right now my studio is literally empty. This is basically literally the That's only it. work I have now. <laughs> and the last work, I just shipped it out to New Jersey this morning. Okay. I, I, I have, um, I work on a lot of works naturally. If not because I shipped out all the whole work, I would have shown you what I have. Um, I work on a lot of work at, at the time, maybe two or three, because sometimes when pieces are finished, they're not actually finished. I may, I may wake up and feel something and I go and okay. alter what is or not just altering or improve or, or on what I already have on canvas. So yeah, that's that's pretty much how I paint. I, but I'm consistent with finishing a, finishing a work. Once I'm on this, I, I have to be. But some pieces take like six months to, to, to finish. Oh, okay. Some pieces take as long as mm. four months. I think the largest piece I've done that took me time was almost eight months. Because of not just because of the size, because I was really, really thinking like I'm, I'm, I'm a kind of artist that my pieces don't speak to me that much. I speak to my piece and they come alive. They don't speak to me to work. I speak on them and they, and they talk back. They don't first talk okay. to me. Mm -hmm. So and because of that, there is a whole lot of thought process going through um, before I paint. Some people could call that a limitation that you have to all be exact before you paint. But in the in the in the realm that I'm going to extract those information, I have to navigate them in a very careful way because it's very precarious. The kind of mental game that we go through to extract those kind of information. Because when I look at a picture, I'm seeing a I'm seeing the spirit of the image, not just the image. I don't paint picture the way they are. I paint the spirits of the imagery. Right. You know. Mm -hmm. So that's pretty much. It. I don't know if I answered your voice a lot. Of... Oh, you you <laughs> definitely answered. <laughs> and it, it's interesting to me. I mean, what you say makes sense because that's your way. So there is no mm -hmm. right or wrong. That's just yeah. your way and that's what's producing your beautiful work. So thank you. No complaint on my side. <laughs> okay. And as far as like the name for your piece, when you name your pieces, how do you come up with the name? Is the name given prior? to creating it during or after very rarely very rarely do do i title my piece before so how how the titles come i have i have um a series i'm, I'm working on a series 
on a particular, I'm working on a particular series. So the title of or the theme of the series I'm doing kind of informs the title that kind of helped me to gather. But then I have I have a team that I work with. We are only three, me, okay. Wheezy Lang, there's a friend called Frank and a friend called McDonald. So these people are very intelligent individuals that I really interact with about my piece. They are all artists, they are all painters. We, we had the same university and oh, um, one of them no longer paints for now he's mm -hmm. into tech and graphics then the other one is a teacher but i'm the only one that is constantly painting so what i do most times is to present my pieces to them we talk very well on on the pieces they ask me they pretty much scrutinize me so after i was done with school my second form of um, unofficial art education came from two of them because they they really pushed me beyond my limit they they pushed me more than they could push themselves like in the in the art world they they make sure I'm completely in check and help me with the titles. Sometimes they give me very beautiful titles that we digress or I come up with a title and they help me break these things down. But everything is essentially what I want to do. I present to them, this is what I'm looking at. What do you think? And right. then we all talk about my paintings. And that has been a, a huge part of some of my titling. So they're like mentors, basically. That's like postgraduate yeah. <laughs> mentors. Absolutely, that you have. absolutely. They're, they're <laughs> my mentors, and I'm very grateful for their friendship. Would you say that being an artist has changed you or has a positive effect on you? Well, if I've known any other life apart from being an artist, I would I can be able to draw a line or make comparison in just opposition to what you just said. But because I don't know any other life apart from That's being an true. artist, <laughs> I can't even know. <laughs> I, I, I can't say otherwise. But I think it's been re really positive, the impact on me. I mean, what, what someone told me, if you weren't an artist, what, what were you going to be? I said a comedian or a lawyer. <laughs> really? <laughs> okay. Those are two very different... <laughs> I'm very funny now. I can be funny when I want to. Okay. Yeah, and I argue a lot. You argue a lot? I argue a lot. So those are two uh, qualities, one for the comedian and one for being a lawyer. So what I'd like to do is jump in now into looking at some of your art. So most of my paintings are very, very family related and those kids you can see in that painting they are all people that i know and i use them as my own story they are all originally from nigeria all those are nigerian kids they are all Enugu state kids they are all from nsoka in Zike, to be precise and you see kids trying to survive you see kids trying to be happy you see kids trying to express themselves but there's a lot of limitation from family from parents trying to pull them down or environmental factors not allowing individual and um, child to pursue their goal or to find a sense of purpose in what they could do. Everyone is judged by, like you said, by the ability to read and write, and that's not the right thing to do. So this is kind of putting everybody in a box. You could see all the keys are in a box. And one of those keys is trying to be out of the box. So the spirit of that child is completely out of that box. He doesn't want to be confined or to be a victim of their environments. So that's- Would you say that's you? <laughs> yeah absolutely. or could represent you yeah that's actually my story i'm telling in a very different way the trees here also in the painting in the middle of the painting you could see something um like a banana tree or a plantain tree a, a plantain leaf and that's literally how the vegetation of where i grew up looks like you could always see banana and plantain trees or pawpaw or palm palm tree or mango but essentially we had um banana and plantain trees and that's why you see it continue appearing in my painting because it's nostalgic those kind of experiences is also i put in mind especially now I have, I'm, i live in america i interact and i have friends here they also i have a little bit of influence from my friends that i have made here and considering them and their story and my own story to come and experience what they're what they yearn for. Right, right. And that um, time in Africa, you know, yearn to see it or be there or have that experience. Mm -hmm. Yeah, mm -hmm. sure. I visited Africa in the late 80s. I went to Nigeria. Oh, okay. <laughs> A 
think it's, it's essentially a reminiscence of out of the box. Um, the stadium, you could see an arena of stadium, and we all know what stadium symbolize uh, men, women, and children gather to cheer for competitions to, in order to choose a winner. That stadium where all men should go and compete to have the finest of humans that live or that exist among the community is incomplete. So that stadium is not being built in a way that is of standard to be able to perform and carry the capacity of the people that is built for. And that's just because of failure of the government to do their duty. So I was mm -hmm. using this painting to talk about family and failure in government. And you don't, you shouldn't allow the failure in governance to affect your dream as a human being. So that is actually my family. And that's why you can see a blood red um, oh. line that goes okay. queer. So we are all same family, related biologically by blood. And if you notice the faces of the people, they are not smiling, not because they don't have love among them, with the hand that that kind of hovers or is over the shoulder, could tell you that is that is love and unity among these people. But yet they are not happy because of the environment. So it still speaks about not being consequent of your environment. You could see this ghostly apparition smiling because he has escaped the the, the turmoil. The, mm. there's a resilience to fight for what you really believe in. And when you see these paintings in the real world, they're a little bit, not a little bit, they're very much different from what you see in reality. The right. textures speak resilience. The textures speak about striving and never giving up. So that ghostly apparition is the human spirit that is never dying. So in as much as I was still in my environment, I was still fighting for freedom. I was still fighting for identity. And that's essentially why it's titled Illumination Beyond Limitation. And and like you said, the child is so happy. It's very, very clear. You see the joy. And I love this vibrant, the vibrant red and, and the eye. It's just beautiful. Can you go a little bit into this one? So I use fork in the painting as our thoughts. How do we anchor our thoughts? How do we bring our thoughts together? It's about meditation, it's about concentration, and it's also about consistency. So this painting is is an eye opener on how we can meet because I was in a space, I was in a space at the time where everything was very heated. I was kind of cloaked in in a very hot um position I was in my life and it wasn't good. So I was working on anchor of work. How do I navigate this very hot position, critical condition that I'm in? while maintaining my sanity. So that eye is, is also a, a way, is a portal into the world I was going through. It's an eye of mercy, it's an eye of longing for something, it's an eye of wish, it's an eye for success and also resilience. And most of my paintings, they have, they're almost unfinished. You see that the painting is, is deliberately unfinished. And that also shows you that I'm, I'm an unfinished pro project. I'm never gonna be finished. I'm a continuous work in progress. And that's why paintings are, most of my paintings are not organized. Like, there's organization here, but they're unfinished. And that's how I live it because I'm a work in progress. But if you hadn't told me that, I wouldn't ever look at this as unfinished. <laughs> I mean, to me, it's beautiful. I don't, Thank I you. don't see that. Um, the red shows up uh, in a lot of your paintings. It might be in a small way, it might be in a larger way, but I do see a a consistency of red. Can you tell us a little bit about this? It's a painting I that took me nearly two months to complete, not because it's difficult to paint, but it was difficult to extract the information I was working with from my head. Um, so if you look at the paintings, what you see is just humans. You don't see colors. You don't see if this person is a white or black person. At first, what you just see is humans. But when you see someone from a distance, what comes to your mind is, humanity a human being and that's what we should aim for and the, the real question is why do i have people at the lower hand side of the painting and why are these people clothed in white and why are they in, in gold in gold color as in their skin form so i was trying to use our mom here as the bedrock of society as the people who are literally responsible that have always been responsible for the kind of human beings we have in the society in terms of instilling discipline, home training, nurturing, and growing a child, women are more inclined to nurturing a human being than men are because they're the ones that give birth to these kids. 
So if every family do their work, mothers here represent both daddy and mom and the family. If we do our job as parents to grow these people the right way, when we send our kids out there, they're going to be ambassadors of the family they come from and they're going to represent us well. So if everyone gave the child a normal gold, um, gold home training, it's going to be like a uniform of an army of good leadership, an army of beautiful relationship, harmonious relationship with the nature of our reality. If these um, mothers or if we as parents do the right thing. So I was, I was only expressing myself on how these mothers, they are very proud. They have all done the right thing. And each of these moms have individual babies and these are their babies and they are all in uniform, but they are, they are not biologically related. But by the nature of having the right discipline and the right home training, they all look alike because that's the world we, we are looking forward to see. That's the world we are praying we have, a world where everybody can come together regardless of what you see, because they are trained well. Racism is not natural. It's just thoughts. So if you right. teach these people the right thing, we can, we can all come together and stand firm. And if we hold on through the night, which is a red moon, we can have a beautiful morning. That's the symbol of the red moon. Oh, to I make like it that. through the night. Yeah. Okay. I like that. That's a wonderful thought. I mean, <laughs> I pray for that. <laughs> Thank I pray you. for that. <laughs> He's going for a competition in in um in South Carolina next month. This piece? Yeah, this piece. Yeah, oh, okay. Yeah. So let's all send positive energy that you uh, that you win. <laughs> Thank you. It, it speaks essentially about how to grow up a child and how to instill the right discipline, the right culture in a child, because kids don't listen to what you say. They copy from your actions. And most of the time we tell our kids the wrong thing, the right thing and do the wrong thing. And they're going to take what we do. You could see the child, the leg of the lady at the right hand side is actually stepping in the shoulder of that child. And that is not in an abusive way. That is from a place of love to smoothen the egos of kids because social media and other social viruses has fueled the mind of our children in a way that they're they have been disrespectful and in a country like america where you're not allowed to hit your child you're not allowed to question your child in some ways they're going to report you or you're going to be sued for trying to go your child off the right way we need to get that away that these kids are being nurtured the right way and shown the right way, healthy way of living in a way that they are going to copy from the people before them and secure the beautiful tomorrow. Those ladies are, they are beautiful. You could sense beauty, you could sense confidence, you could sense self-awareness, and you could sense immense level of beauty without them being naked. They are not really showing some self They're not being self they're just being who they are and they still look beautiful. So it's... If you check their hair tie, you could see that they have the same hair tie as a little baby. A, a constant reminder that the child is heading towards the right direction. So be a child uh, and then the parent is there to kind of guide you. Guide, exactly. Into the right behavior. <laughs> You're not at guide that you age where you can figure it out. Mm -hmm. Right, exactly. True. And I show this one, I see this one shows like the cracks that you were talking about Yeah. Uh, in the earth. Is a transition. When I was transi transitioning through my crack story to saturated nostalgia, where I started talking more, I started being more family oriented in my expression. And um, it, it's kind of a, a an amalgam of two different elements. This is kind of the fusion, the point of interception or intercession where the crack story met the the saturated nostalgia that came they all came together that's mm. what this piece really represent but the piece just means um the dissolution of ego that's the title trying to when i was is it is a, a self-cautioning piece to let me know regardless of whatever thing you do regardless of how far you're going or how low you are you are nothing we are all every human being is equal we are all the same breathing the same air sharing literally the space we occupy is the same the matter we occupy is the same and no matter what we do or what we achieve everyone is the same and we should try to understand that ego is nothing we should kind of should control our ego in a way that is not going to be detrimental to the people around us and that's what that piece represents that was a, a direct message to my own self to 
it's not like I have, it's not like I have ego. It's just like, uh, I mean, every human being has got ego. Right. I do have ego, but uh, a reminder of the danger of what ego could mean if you don't harness it very well. And that is just a very beautiful lady breaking out in, in all her redness, in all her beauty. There is a dissolution of that ego. And in bracket is also tied to a meek confession. It's a confession to my own self, some kind of a self exorcism. I'm exercising myself to cleanse whatever um, negative energy that is fueling that ego. And behind that red lady is me. It's I thought I saw face. someone. It's I thought me. I yeah, saw someone. Food. Okay. I was nice. in a hood. Yeah, oh. staring, uh, staring at the, the, uh, someone who's had ego and the destruction of the human ego. So that is mm. me staring and looking at someone's ego being destroyed. So I mm. learned from it. Wow. Okay. <laughs> I like that. Your all of your uh I see now why you have to take that time because everything has a very deep meaning. Very deep. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and I like it. If you look at the painting, it's um <clears throat> I, I work on models a lot because I respect women a lot. I, I believe women are the only people that have the ability to create life source, to reproduce, to give life to anything. And um, I use them a lot in my paintings as a way to anchor my thoughts in terms of respect, appreciation, and being grateful that we have these beautiful people around us while also appreciating their efforts financially. So this is a child these mothers they are actually dancing in unison they are all dancing in celebration because they've all donated money to send that child to the higher institution which is the university of nigeria is a metaphor for how we live closely live in harmonious relationship in our community back then because when i was younger if a child wanted to go to university it's an expensive um venture so what happens is people come together, donate money to make sure that this, people, this person goes to school. But here, I use their igele, and I switch. We call it Isui Chapu. I'm an Igbo person. That's what they call it, Isui Chapu. They all tie this hair tie on their hair, which is a symbol of prestige, beauty. They're always something they're really pride in when they tie. They have all donated something of value to this single individual that they are not even biologically related to this person, but by the virtue of community, they understand the importance of one person making it if everyone has made it. It takes a village to raise a child. One man can never raise a child. And that's a perfect example of being raised by the entire community. You could feel the, just the, the, the pride and the seriousness of that individual, knowing fully well that he's someone of enormous consequence because of what he represents, because of the people that have seen him through. So this is just uh, an expression of community relationship and how we can all come together and achieve something that was impossible for one person. Yeah, I mean, man's, um, man's dominance is not a celebration of power, but an inner strength to provide for his loved ones, for even in pain, his soul will sing praises of satisfaction. It's just how to be in a child's life, to be in the picture. You don't need to be out of the picture of your child. You need to be there to perpetuate the, the, um, the existential um, relevance of that child, not just existing, but living well, because if you're not there, the person is not, the person could be alive, but he's not really growing. And the person is going to end up in a bad place because being alive is not enough. You need to be, you need to have something to offer to the community, to society, to be able to fuel this beautiful um, world we live in, to be able to contribute positively. So it becomes an endless cycle of regeneration of beauty not ugliness or shooting or trying to rip people off so this is a child's picture that the child is the father is trying so hard to be part of you could see the joy in his face the man is not happy but he has to be there he could kill the pain the right. bloodshed the mm -hmm. everything he's going through but he's there to be present and make sure the child has the best life has to offer and that should be the story of every young individual we have to we really 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 need to be present in the life of these people to enable them have a better life afterwards. Right, just to uh, build on each generation, because if you're not there, then, then we don't know what can happen. You're, if you're not yeah. there to provide the foundation, mm -hmm. the child has to seek it on their own and they may not go in the right places mm -hmm. to get what they need. True. So I agree with you. Ooh, 
Bush. That's my mom. <laughs> that's that's beautiful. <laughs> oh, thank you. This looks so real. I mean, I know you don't do photorealism, but you're just showing how you can do it if you want yeah. to, because this is amazing. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> it looks just <laughs> like you. a picture. <laughs> thank you so much. And mom is beautiful. Is oh, mom in Nigeria? Is she yes. still in Nigeria? Okay. Do you get yeah. to go back and visit often? I'm hoping to go. So I've, I've been in America for only two years. Oh, okay. Yeah, I've been in America for only two years, so I, I mean, I, I miss them already, but I have to get my things together. I have to get ready to go back and show love, and I always speak to them every day. I literally every day I call home and we talk. I'm the last. They have like six of me. Right, right, exactly. <laughs> so, I'm not sure they are, they are, they're going to go crazy if they don't see me. Right. <laughs> well, you know, you're the the baby i guess the way it's put but you're not a baby but that's how it's <laughs> termed the baby and you look very happy here tell us a little bit about what's going on <laughs> that was um that's in blackout america one of the very first galleries that i work with here in atlanta georgia so my my sojourn in america started in new york where i arrived in new york um it was a very beautiful welcome by Agora Gallery from New York. I had to go to Texas, built myself up and came to Atlanta, which is kind of the hub of black community, which I'm very grateful for them here. Then I met um, with Naji Dose, who is an amazing human being. He gave me the opportunity to be part of the opening of the Black Art in America, the headquarters. So I literally joined the opening by the virtue of divinity it was just meant to be because they have planned this show for a long time and i just came out of dining like a month and boom i'm exhibiting in black on america is a huge leap in my career because even if i had met them a year prior they already had everything booked up they already had the kind of artists they want to exhibit and they already had a schedule but because it was meant to be i was meant to be there at a particular time it has to happen. So that's hence the happiness you see on my face. <laughs> <laughs> that looks genuine, genuine happiness. So, um, so how did you meet? Like, how did it come about your getting in since it was all, they had all the artists they needed? Met, met him through a friend. I, I was, uh, I was in a friend's studio walking. He wanted to exhibit my friends, my friend. And which is Jonathan Imakido, who is also a great, great guy. He's one of the Atlanta big artists. He's a sculptor now. He used to be a painter. He found a sculptor. He's mm -hmm. been very helpful to me as well. Um, he's a senior colleague, but he's my friend and mentor too. He just saw me working on something. I was just very serious working on a strip. He was like, hey, I was going to say, I'm okay. Are you a painter? I said, I'm a painter. Oh, let me see your work. Oh, this is a painter. Yeah, okay, come to this studio and let's see. I came to the studio with that piece. <laughs> He was like, who the hell are you? You are coming to <laughs> see me for the Friday. You're coming with this. It was like- A gigantic piece. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and that was how it happened. And since then, the rest of the story has just been Sussex story upon Sussex story. Yeah, he saw that and he was like, I gotta have it. <laughs> this has to be in the show. <laughs> yeah. Okay, I'm gonna um, close out of this. We're gonna jump into our little fun questions. <laughs> So let's go into our little fun questions here. This is totally not art related. Um, do you have a, well, you said you would be a comedian or attorney if you weren't an artist, but do you have any hobbies or other secondary interests that, you know, that you put time into? <laughs> yeah, I, I, can, I, can, I can do one for you now. What is it? <laughs> go I ahead. Do, I, I play flutes. Oh, go ahead. Yeah, go for it. Let me see. Let's me hear try. it. <laughs> okay, hold on. Okay. <laughs> Let me see if I can do something for you. Beautiful. 
So you're like, not only will I answer you, I'll show you. <laughs> okay. And if you, I, I read that you paint using acrylic and oil paint. But what if you only had to choose one, which would be the one you'd have you pick? Ooh, that, that's a very, very <laughs> difficult question. Difficult. <laughs> very difficult question. I, <laughs> <laughs> I, know, I feel like I'm going to betray Warren if I have to choose one. Just for one like piece, that. then. You're only doing one piece of art, and you have to pick one. After that, you can go back. So betray acrylic, it for just acrylic, one. Acrylic. Acrylic. acrylic? Okay. Okay. <laughs> Um, where's somewhere that you'd like to visit that you've never been to before, like out of the country? <laughs> def def definitely, I would like to see the pyramids. Okay. Yeah, I would like to see the pyramids. It's it's kind of, uh, it gives you an idea of what was before us. Right. I agree. The pyramid I'm talking about is the one is in it Egypt. Egypt, yeah. right, in Africa, yeah. <laughs> Say someone gave you the, the, the what you're putting on. It's, um... In hieroglyphics. Oh, but, hieroglyphics, yeah. Yeah, but it's my name. The right oh. <laughs> Exactly. <laughs> um, let's see. Let's find another question. If you had to pick, would you rather... I think I already know the answer, but since it's on the list, I'll ask it. Would you okay. pick a home-cooked meal or dinner at your favorite restaurant? Home, of course. Of course. I knew. I knew. I knew the answer. <laughs> I was like, should I waste time even asking this question? <laughs> Okay, if you could meet any living person for dinner, who would you pick and why? If I could meet any living person for dinner? Yes. My, Mike Anybody. Tyson. Mike, Mike Tyson? Tyson? Oh, yes. you have to tell us. Why? Um, um, he, <laughs> it, it may sound weird, but he made me a better person. Okay. The, the way he, I mean, his story, where he came from, from um, Catskill, New York, being um, literally having zero self-confidence. He didn't believe in himself. He didn't. I mean, it was almost like my own story, mm. but he definitely has bigger success and everything. I mean, he never envisioned himself where he was, how he made Costa de Mato. And then from then, he started training very hard at a very early age. He became very disciplined and consistent with, he, with what he was doing and was able to win the youngest heavyweight championship ever. That, that's, that, that speaks so much to me. And when I watch the level of violence he, he expressed in the ring and how he's able to go for his dream, it's almost like trying to, he's, he's fighting his way out. And I can put myself in that same story. When I paint, I watch him fight and I, I envision myself painting, you know, the struggles and not trying to give up the, the knockout and the anger is almost the kind of frustration I had when I was a child. And I can relate so much to him mm. as a person. And he's an intellectual. Yeah, he is. Which I, I love intellectual. So I would like to definitely have a dinner with him he's an amazing uh, one one on one no one else <laughs> one on that one, would yeah. be good and I'm, I'm sure you'd have like just you're ready it sounds like you're ready like you, you wouldn't you know how sometimes people meet someone they've always wanted to meet and then they're tongue-tied and nervous and don't know what to I, say. I, 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 I could be i may be tongue-tied you think no? so <laughs> I, i'm a very nervous person i i'm a very nervous person oh okay so you have to have it like ready in your mind like something you'll say so you don't like oh uh, um hey <laughs> so we are pretty much done so now i just want to know like what? Oh, I did have one question. What would your five-year-old self think about all the success that you are having now? Um, he would think it was. He, he would think it's impossible. He would think it's. He would think it's. It's impossible. You know, it's a very rough. It's very, very, very rough road. Mm -hmm. Sorry. Very, very rough road. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I wouldn't. I would never. I would never imagine I would be able to communicate in English language. Not because I wasn't. 
not because my, the people around me didn't speak, but my brain wasn't able to comprehend that. You know, it's, right. I'm humbled. I'm, it's a privilege to be able to, you know, navigate this this very turbulent water and call myself to my own individual shores of identity and the expression I know how to. And I'm grateful to God. I'm grateful to family. I'm grateful to my sister and my friends. I'm just grateful. I don't know. I would have, I would never have imagined. having a voice and it's that's the truth i would never have imagined having a voice and i'm grateful for who i am today i'm grateful for everything i'm grateful to god and thank you for having me it's been unbelievable <laughs> Woo! <Yeah. laughs> you got me going now uh, oh, boy. Right. <laughs> <laughs> whoa i'm glad i have on glasses hopefully no one can see <laughs> It's all good. Um, wow, I didn't expect that. Yeah. Okay, but that's that's beautiful. You, I mean, that answers the question more than words could. You know what I'm saying? Like the emotion. Ooh, I'm trying to <laughs> get <laughs> my sorry. voice back because I'm, I'm trying so, to. I'm get... sorry. I'm sorry. No, I, I mean it's beautiful. <laughs> it's that's real. You know what I'm saying? It's real. And I, I, I don't, you don't, nothing to apologize for at all. Thank you. So you did mention the, this is like just what's coming. You have a lot going on. You have this show at the Mason Fine Art, Fine Art yeah. in Atlanta. You have a competition in New Jersey. No, uh, not in New Jersey, in um, South Carolina. South Carolina. Yeah. And sorry, and do you have anything else like on the horizon or, or yeah, something have, that you yeah, sorry, I'm 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 gonna oh, stop no. like said. <laughs> no, 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 please. <laughs> I have um, I have a show coming up next month in Smyrna Library, public library, Smyrna. Okay. My old crack stories. I'm gonna be exhibiting them again. They have not been exhibited since they're direct. Some of it has never been exhibited since they were created. That was like in 2015, 2016, and I'm gonna be exhibiting them. So I think it's something of joy if you're an art lover and if you've been following what i'm doing to see my crack story again i would love to see it and what are the dates um the dates so it all depends on me i'm looking at paints of next month it's going to kick off paints of next month it's going to be day walking for anyone to view okay from paints yes and did you want to talk about what's happening in miami is that a show or is that something else yeah it's um so we are planning we are planning a show for next year actually okay <laughs> but the publicity starts this month okay. because yeah they want to do um a one year span of promotion especially with the kind of piece i have so people have been informed that this piece is coming to miami so people are literally waiting for my saturated nostalgia to get nice. to the gallery <laughs> so they can all feel it so yeah that's pretty much the show i have it's gonna be unofficially my first solo show oh wonderful isn't, isn't that crazy <laughs> Thank you. you have to keep us informed of that Thank so you. we can help promote as well Thank you. want to help promote that <laughs> well thank you so much this has been amazing <laughs> i've enjoyed in mason you can go view it anytime they're in mason fine Arts yes in here Yes, definitely. We'll put everything in the description below. So definitely check there for any information as to where you will be soon and your next show. And then you'll let us know as things I'll are happening and we'll help promote that for you as well. But thank you so much for taking time to talk with us and to really go deep with it. Thank like you. not I'm superficial. Grateful. You went deep and it's wonderful because we really got to learn about yeah. each one of your pieces and just where you're coming from. So I loved oh, thank it. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Take care.